Hi, I'm Femi O.K. and you're in the stream. Today, a suicidal young woman denied an abortion in Ireland has reignited the debate about the country's abortion laws. So this is a hot topic in Ireland right now. Our digital producer Malika Balau is looking out for the online feedback. I know we're getting quite a lot from our Irish viewers, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a hot topic online and on the street. So mm. one of the hashtags people are rallying under is repeal the eighth, and that refers to the Eighth Amendment of Ireland's constitution, uh, which is, uh, it looks at the rights of the unborn to life. Okay. So. With that, you can see on my screen here a whole bunch of videos uploaded to the site Vine of people rallying under that hashtag. Of course, there's also a protest plan for Friday on the opposing side. So whichever side you fall on, we want to hear from you. Use the hashtag AJStream. I'm a feminist researcher on family um, relationship and reproduction issues, and I'm in the stream. Ireland's abortion laws have been called into question for the second time in less than two years. On this occasion, a young woman was denied an abortion despite claims she was raped and was feeling suicidal. In response, she went on a hunger strike and later was forced to deliver her baby at 24 weeks by caesarean section. This is the first controversial case since the Protection of Life During Pregnancy Act was introduced after the death of Safita Halapanava, and that was back in 2012. She died from blood poisoning after doctors refused to terminate her pregnancy. So if the whole point of this new act was to deal with special abortion cases, is it working? To help us discuss this, we're joined by Sarah McCarthy, spokeswoman for the Galway Pro-Choice Group. Shauna Stafford is spokeswoman for the Pro-Life Campaign. Dr. Mary Favier is a family physician and spokeswoman for the Doctors for Choice group and Bishop Kevin Duran from the Elfin Diocese. So it is good to have you all here in the stream. Welcome everybody. Dr. Mary Favier, there is so much information about this young woman. It's extraordinary that it's all in the, in the public space here, but let's boil it down to basics. A uh, young woman su feeling suicidal, wants an abortion in Ireland. Why would she not be able to get one? What's the issue here? She came to Ireland very early in pregnancy as, a, uh, as an asylum seeker. She, at, at a reception visit where she saw a doctor, it was established she was pregnant. She then was taken to see the Family Planning Association where they gave her extensive counseling and support and she sought an abortion. They put a lot of effort into trying to get her travel papers which she, because she had no passport status in Ireland and they couldn't do that. She then w was lost to their follow-up and she then came through the HSC services. And this is where some of the story gets a little bit murky about what actually happened next. But then she eventually saw a GP late in pregnancy at about 18, 19 weeks when she had significant mental health deterioration because she wasn't able to access an abortion. She be her mental health deteriorated. She became suicidal. She was admitted to a psychiatric institution. Two, uh, two psychiatrists under the, the new act from last year ruled that she w she fitted the criteria for the act and that she should have a termination of pregnancy. Third opinion was needed. That was of an obstetrician gynecologist. He or she said no. And then we had a situation where she went on a, on a hunger strike. The public health service, the HSE as it's called in Ireland, the health service executive got a court order to have her forcibly hydrated. And then she underwent a cesarean section. So there are somewhat the bald facts of, of what had happened. This baby was then, was then born at 24, 25 weeks with all the attendant problems of that. And then the controversy broke. And wow. that all right, so um, Shona, so the baby wasn't terminated, the baby was born. Does this make you feel like, okay, the law is working? Or do you think something went awry in this situation? I think we, uh, the pro-life campaign and the pro-life movement have said from the very beginning when this law was first proposed that this is an, a flawed law. It is unjust, uh, it is highly irresponsible. A woman came to our country having been raped in her homeland and uh, she was failed in every way by our state thanks to the legislation that was passed last year by the government. So Shona, what, do you, think should have, what no, do you think should have happened though? Well, I'll tell you now, she presented herself as suicidal. What this legislation effectively does is um, prescribe a termination of pregnancy for women who present as suicidal in pregnancy regardless of the fact that there's no medical evidence to suggest that this would in any way 
uh, relieve, help to relieve uh, the woman of her suicidal ideation. So what we have tonight in a Dublin hospital is we have a woman who is still experiencing mental anguish and mental distress. And we also have a little baby who's clinging to life in an incubator because of being delivered 15 weeks early for no medical reason, for no me with no medical evidence. Uh, no medical evidence would suggest that this was in the best interests of the mother or the baby. And I believe that to be highly inappropriate, highly irresponsible of our government, we warned the people of Ireland um, in a number of vigils that we hosted before the passing of the legislation. We were given minimal coverage by the Irish media and we were completely and utterly ignored by our government. We predicted situations like the one that we're facing this week. And um, I believe that, that the government need to be held accountable for uh, that woman's situation now and for her baby situation. Well, Sarah, I want to bring you in here um, with this discussion taking place on Twitter for, among our community. And they're talking about the panel that a suicidal pregnant woman would go through uh, to determine her mental state and to determine what happens next. So Dahi on Twitter says, if suicidal ideology exists, abortion is supposed to be permitted. But in this case, it appears it was denied despite a panel of three agreeing that she was suicidal. So what are the criteria for this panel uh, to make its determinations? Well, I mean, yeah, you've raised a number of issues here with this legislation. I, I would absolutely agree that this legislation does fail women. One of the things that happened to this woman at eight weeks pregnant, she stated that she would rather die than continue with this pregnancy. And it seems that one of the flaws in the legislation is that whatever medical professional she said this to was not required to convene the panel of three medical professionals. That did not happen until she was 20 weeks along in her pregnancy and had already made an attempt on her life, on her own life. So a woman who is suicidal is entitled to an abortion under Irish law, but it seems that these procedures do not allow for that right to be realised. So, Bishop, are we just looking at a, a situation here where there's a there's a law in place that's to help women when they're in a really deep crisis, a medical emergency, and we're actually seeing perhaps that it may not be working, or is it working? What's the cho What's well, the church's perspective I, I, here? Yes, ju ju just to respond to that, yeah. uh, I. I I think the law is not designed to help women. That's part of the problem because ah. from my perspective, the uh, proposal to provide an abortion for women in a crisis pregnancy context is not helping anybody. It's not helping them and it's not helping their children. Psychiatrists have, have by majority advised the government here in Ireland that women who experience suicidal ideation in the course of pregnancy uh, can be uh, treated effectively and that's what psychiatrists do. Uh, unfortunately, as far as I understand, uh, psychiatric intervention uh, for this woman began when the panel met 20 weeks into her pregnancy. And there's no evidence whatsoever that she received any psychiatric mm. care. See, I have, an, I, have an issue, I have an issue with this because I'm, I'm actually thinking it seems almost unethical for us to be unpacking a young woman's medical case. But let's make it a little bit mm. broader about can this law work? It's always going to be in a tricky situation, Bishop. Can it work? Yeah. Well, we, we in the Catholic Church uh, always maintained that it was an unjust law in the first instance. I mean, we, we have a position which is broadly reflected in the Irish Constitution that the life of the mother and the life of the child are both to be valued and on an equal basis. Unfortunately, a judge in the Supreme Court in 1992 uh, argued that while the right to life of the mother and the right to life of the child were equal, somehow or other the right to life of the mother carried greater weight. Mm. Uh, we don't accept that. They, they carry uh, weight equally. equally. So, if a, if a child, so, so Bishop, if we had a situation where a child was very ill, um, a baby was very ill, a mother was very ill, what would you? What would be the church's advice to doctors? The church's advice to medical professionals would be that they always have an obligation to the, to do their best to save whatever life they can save. Right. And if in the process of intervention to save the mother's life, the child dies through no direct intent on the part of the medical professionals, that's a perfectly uh, 
acceptable though sad outcome right um, the problem is the intervention which is proposed in the legislation sure. in the case of suicidal ideation is an action which will terminate deliberately end the life of the child on the basis that the woman might possibly commit suicide right without I, perhaps I, in any sense helping the woman to uh, resolve the issue through some other means well, you, Dr. I Dr. Dr. Mary, I, I wanted to go to you because uh, online people are asking what services are in place uh, for treatment, for evaluation. Um, one of the hashtags that's being used online is equal care. Uh, Sophie tweets, no evidence of positive benefit of abortion for suicidality. Evidence-based medicine means equal care for moms and babies. So what resources are there? The resources are very limited and you've got to remember that for a woman who's faced with a crisis pregnancy and you got the, and they want to end the pregnancy this you remember this woman was viciously raped she didn't just want to end the pregnancy she wanted to not have a baby in these circumstances with all types of cultural implications in her community for being an unmarried parent it was i mean there are very significant issues here so she, but in in an irish context there's no solution to that. This law is flawed because it doesn't protect rape victims, it doesn't protect those who are survivors of incest, those with fatal fetal abnormalities, and we thought it might protect those at suicide risk, and it has, has failed this woman. Because I'd ask the baby, bishop... Not no, I, no, just, just a second, Bishop. I'd ask the bishop, what would he suggest that have been done? Should she be have been tied down, tied up? She already had court orders to okay, act so to Dr. hydrate her. Do Dr. What Favia? was his plan for 15 more weeks? Dr. Favour, allow the Bishop to answer, and also, Sean, I can see you wanting to jump in there as well, so I'll get to you in just a moment. Go ahead, Bishop. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer to that question is she should have been provided with proper psychiatric care from the moment she presented. Unfortunately, it seems that her first contacts were with a private family planning agency, which is a commercial operation and which is not uh, set out uh, to provide psychiatric care, but only to uh, provide um, a response to crisis pregnancy in terms of, of of uh, referring people on, uh, perhaps for for abortion, um, but in in my uh, understanding, the problem is she wasn't uh, provided with with proper psychiatric care. I, and I, I have to say, one of the one of the challenges it's, it's I, the state who failed her, rather than any individual institution. This she woman didn't, didn't present to the state apparently. This it woman didn't, didn't present necessarily to the state have the psychiatric state. problems. There is very good evidence to show that, show that it's only when women are denied access to abortion that their mental health deteriorates. And this Nonsense woman is an obvious right. example. She became suicidal because she was denied the opportunity to have a pregnancy uh, terminated. She That's it was a, no. accepted that she should go to the UK because for your worldwide listers, you might think there's no abortion provided in Ireland, but there's up to 4,000 every year in the UK and at least another thousand thought to have abortions online through medication pills. So Ireland does have abortion we just don't have it in this country and if you're well educated middle class affluent and can afford the 1000 euros to get there we sweep it under the carpet and say it doesn't happen but for women with disability who have no money who are in this case have no right to travel in terms of documents they're the women who fall victim and foul of the state and the state and its institutions like the health service executive need to take responsibility they failed this woman ever right. before she had mental health problems. All right, so Dr. F Dr. Murphy, Why did they send just her take, to take, a, a take a breath for a moment, because again, I, I personally find it upsetting that we're unpacking one particular Indeed. young right. woman, teenager's case, but we're talking about an actual law. So Shauna, what did you want to add? I know you wanted to join in. Well, firstly, Femi, I would completely agree with you that uh, we shouldn't even be speaking about this case at the moment. There is a woman who is still in mental anguish, who has no family or friends in this country, who does not speak English. She is a victim of rape. She has just had uh, gone through right. major so surgery. So, Shauna, we're, we're going over old ground here. Broaden well, it out I, for us. Talk I, about the, the actual act. That, yeah. The reason I say that is because somehow her story fell into the hands of journalists. Okay. Uh, and, and there's obviously nobody protecting her. Right. What I would like to say is it's interesting that uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Favier sees this now as a flawed law. I was outside our Houses of Parliament or our government buildings when the legislation was passed and we held a silent vigil. Um, Pro-choice were also present and they cheered and clapped when the law was passed and they chanted one step closer. Um, this was always uh, Doctors uh, supported. Doctors for Choice never supported this, this law. 
Well, I don't know, Dr. Favier, if you were there or not, but certainly people who, on your side of the debate cheered this law and supported it. We came out in our thousands four times in the last 18 months and were ignored when we, when we, caught, when we predicted the situation that we find ourselves in this week. The other thing I'd just like to say is, and I think it's a, a phrase that, that creeps into the debate, and I think it's something we need to be very careful of. We've of, we often refer to the children uh, of, that are conceived in rape as a rapist child. You know, how could this woman carry a baby conceived like this? We need to be very careful of that and we need to remind ourselves that there'll be pe people watching this at home this evening who were themselves conceived in rape or who gave birth to children who were conceived in rape. And how do we think those people will feel being referred to as a rapist child? Rapists should have no claim over these children. These are their mother's children. But I think you're the only and person making well, that statement. Well, I, I, I found it's being said over and over again in this debate in Ireland. Dr. Favier, I, uh, you, you referred to the, the woman carrying this child conceived in these circumstances. Um, I didn't actually mention that she'd been raped. I think it was you did that. Right. Uh, you know and I think, I think, I think that, that's actually, the issue is you, we had this very young vulnerable woman who instead of her having to have the wherewithal to ask to use this law, she should have had it presented to her as an option. She, she was well, not. Favier, and that goes to the chilling effect that exists in the Irish health services that so many people are afraid to mention the issue of abortion because doctors and other health workers face 14 years imprisonment if they are in any way found to aid or abet a woman having an abortion. Now that is a grievously chilling impact on doctors All and right. health care so, workers. So Dr. And Mary Favia okay. and, Sh and Shauna Stafford, I'm just going to ask you just to take a breather just for a moment so we can go back to our online community. Malika. Oh, right, they have so much to say on this and Sarah I actually want to bring you back in here um, with this, talking about options and workarounds. Um, on Facebook, Melinda suggests that people uh, face abortions maybe should go to the UK to have an abortion or Denmark uh, someone else sent us a video comment on why that may not always be possible she shared her story I want you to have a listen to this hi there about um, about three years ago I had an abortion in Ireland um, where I bought pills online from women on web um, in order to have the abortion it simply wasn't financially feasible for me to have a child nor was I old enough like I was 19 at the time as a student but on top of that it w I just didn't have the funds either to go to the UK to have an abortion because it would have cost me a um, thousand euros so I ended up taking the pills um, instead. So Sarah while there may be safe options is there some danger to this? Well, I mean, I think what you've raised here is the very important point that a lot of people think that because the UK is so close to Ireland, our laws don't affect women too badly, they can always travel to access an abortion. And while 12 women do travel every day to access abortion, there are a lot of women who don't have the financial means to travel, they don't have the legal status to travel, they may have an abusive partner who won't let them out of their sight, they might live in a rural community, they might not be able to get someone to look after their children, to get the time off work. There are so many obstacles facing women to travel to the UK that what happens is the most marginalised and the most vulnerable women are those that suffer. The abortion support network in the UK every day hear from women who resort to desperate means to try and end their pregnancies, they hear from women who've tried to drink bleach, who've thrown themselves downstairs, who've tried to crash their cars, oh. but there are also many women who do order abortion pills online and self-administer their abortions at home. Um, in 2009, Customs seized over 1,200 packets of these tablets, so we know that this is happening every day. While it's obviously not an ideal situation, before nine weeks, a medical abortion is incredibly safe. It carries the same risks as an early miscarriage, which are quite low. Maybe Mary can speak about this a bit I more. Think, but, I mean, for a woman who doesn't have the ability to travel to the UK, ordering these pills off women on web is the safest route. And there's a lot of women who are safely self-administering this procedure themselves. Could Bishop. I come in here again, please? For yeah, a moment? please go ahead, Bishop. Yeah, I, I think, you know, isn't this very sad, really? Because what we're saying is that here there are two victims, really, where abortion is concerned. Just listening to the last comments there, we're talking about uh, women who uh, are perhaps you know suffering from you know abusive partners or financial difficulties or emotional stress or whatever and then added to that 
they have uh, the abortion, which itself is a further violation of of their humanity. And then alongside that, Bishop you have Jordan, the child I don't who see, suffers. I don't see the, who you and the are child. To sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking now. Still, humanity. I'm still speaking. I think I think it is because I, I mean it, it, uh, the the whole um, uh, process of pregnancy is a perfectly uh, natural and normal process. And Bishop, it, it has to be. I'm sorry. Excuse like me. That. It has to be perfectly. It has to be very traumatic for a woman uh, That's not to the terminate evidence. the life growing in her womb. And then, of course, there's no such thing as a safe abortion where the baby is concerned. There's the absolutely evidence, no evidence that abortion causes mental health problems for women. Uh, in 2010, well, psychiatrists who gave it evidence to the Irish government last year said, said that it was, it the was correct likely to them. cause more okay, stress. So, no, so Bishop, and also for Sarah, let's just do one at a time. Sarah, make a very quick point. Let the Bishop um, make a point back. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, well, I just wanted to counter the bishop's characterization mm -hmm. of abortion as a violation. The the most common uh, emotion that women say they experience after abortion is relief. There's mm -hmm. absolutely no evidence that abortion causes mental health problems or any form of physical problems. Okay. There are a number of reasons why women choose to have abortions. and many of those women already have children and that decision should be in their hands alone pregnant he, he characterized pregnancy as an entirely natural process and that is true it can be a wonderful process when you want to have a child if you don't want to have a child it can be an absolute nightmare and pregnancy is incredibly risky women die from pregnancy every day so it's it, it should be their decision whether to continue with a pregnancy or not. Let Nobody me just else check in with you, yes, because we've got about yeah. a minute left. Could I, could I just respond to that? Because you did say I could respond. Uh, yes, you, you actually may. I, I just want to check in with you all as, as well, just very, very quickly. The Protection of Life During Pregnancy Act. Is there anybody who's on this show right now who actually likes the act? No. No, Certainly no it's terrible. Wow. Okay. Yeah. May I no, just, nobody it likes it. From the beginning. May okay. I May All I right. just put a question, please? Uh, uh, Shona, Shona okay. hold, hold tight for a moment because the bishop is going to go ahead. Go, bishop, be very brief because we're almost at the end yeah. of this part of the show. Go ahead. Yeah, this is just a very brief uh, comment and it's simply to say that one thing that's being overlooked to some extent in some of the comment is that uh, whether you wish to be or not, when you're pregnant, you already have a child. It's not a question of whether you want to have one. Uh, it's You already have one. And, no, and, and nobody, I, I don't think you can ignore that. You can never describe a fetus as a child. What? All, I'm sorry, all but that's, that's a point when, in which when we the baby is born, it becomes uh, a child. If, if, All right, if, if this, is a, there, can I I mean, uh, this is a good point. Can I just make a This is a very please. good point for me to say all of your four quick points that you're about to make are going to be made, but I'm going to take you to the post show at stream.aljazeera.com. You can hear there's still a lot of energy in this conversation. We're going to head online in just a moment but Malika tell us what, what you're seeing online what's I, how people are reacting to this conversation um, well I'll give you two tweets to wrap up this is just sort of general sentiment Siobhan mm. says the eighth amendment claims they have equal status but the government makes it clear that once you're pregnant a woman becomes an incubator and this one we can talk about in the post show Rebecca says no one under the age of 40 in Ireland has been able to vote on the eighth amendment which has left us with inadequate laws so we can talk about whether or not public opinion is changing and you can talk to Dr. Mary Favia. She's a spokeswoman for Doctors for Choice Group. We also have Sarah McCarthy. She's from the Galway Pro-Choice Group. We have Shauna Stafford from Pro-Life Campaign and also Bishop Kevin Duran. He's a Bishop of Elfin. So they all will be at the post show at stream.aldazeera.com. You'll be able to hear what other points they want to make about this Protection of Life During Pregnancy Act. Meanwhile, let's talk about what's happening on Monday. I will be watching the stream from the Global Media Forum in Indonesia. So, <laughs> it's a tough place life. to yes. watch the stream from. <laughs> so what will be on Monday's show? We're talking about women and their role in conflict resolution, so I'm excited okay. about it. We'll ask the question, why aren't more women getting a seat at the table? That's Monday's show. Until then, we'll see you online.
This is the Streams Online Post Show. We've been talking about a new case that has reignited a debate over Ireland's abortion law. If you were just watching the end of the main show, you heard all of our guests all about to make points. I'm actually going to go back to them one by one. Shauna, what did you want to say? Thanks, Femi. Well, firstly, I just find it hard to believe that uh, Dr. Favier there is telling me that uh, a baby isn't a baby until it's born. I am 36 I weeks pregnant as I child. speak. It's not a child. I'm 36 weeks pregnant as I speak, Dr. Favier, and I believe me, this baby is a baby. It's kicking me in the ribs right now. Uh, I can feel its hands and feet. So uh, I think that's proof uh, that, that a baby is a child in the womb. I, um, I would children. also like to they say, became children I would also when they like were born. to say, Dr. Favier, Sh I would also Shona, like to Shona, say Shona, I'm going to ask you to do Shona, Shona, hold, on, hold tight for a moment. At the moment. Shona, hold tight for if a moment. If I could just make this point. Yes, I just, I, I just want to ask you something, though. I know you've got your notes to one side, but this is a, as you, you talk from the heart, speak from your passion don't okay. read don't read off your I, talking points to the side of your your screen because no, no problem then you're I'm, not joining I'm, in the I'm real in, conversation i understand i'm just i'm supposed i'm not a, a seasoned performer but, you're, done you're, this before. but you're speaking from so the heart and you're doing great so just just carry thank on in you that very way. Much. um the, there is an, a, an inconvenient truth for pro-choice campaigners and that is the fact that there is a little baby uh, clinging to life in an incubator this evening in Dublin, uh, 24 weeks gestation. Now I would like to ask uh, Dr. Favier and Sarah, do they think that that baby deserves medical care? And if they say yes, why would that same baby at 24 weeks gestation in the womb uh, be, be uh, why would it be okay for that baby to be terminated and aborted, uh, the, the very same child? Would you like me to answer that do first? You, do you, I, I would. I would like you to. Uh, I would like you to answer whether that baby deserves medical care now. I, I think that's an extraordinary question. Y you don't need to be a doctor to say, of course, that baby deserves the best of care. But why was that baby ever placed in that position? This is a, the, you know, you of yourself know that 80 percent of babies born at 24, 25 weeks die. So there's only a 20 percent survival rate. And then and that's why we protested the law, Dr. Favier. Only that's 20 why we percent. The law. Listen to me a second. Only 20 percent of that 20 percent will get to adulthood without significant handicap or disability. So Absolutely. the decision to intervene at that time was an extraordinary one. That woman was forced to be an incubator effectively from a very early stage in her pregnancy when she was denied a very basic human right and so that this could happen? How, how could that so happen? So at what stage, could I, could I, I ask, uh, at what stage does the baby that, get that baby its rights then? I mean, is it six weeks, the, eight weeks, ten it, weeks? It's not, well, for a start, it's not about the baby having rights that are separate or different to the mother. The mother's rights But the rights baby's a separate are, individual. No. So genetically no, and, we must, and physically no, a separate this is our individual. Difficulty. This is the difficulty with the Eighth Amendment. Now, the Eighth Amendment, for people who are watching worldwide, was introduced in the Irish Constitution in 1983, where there had previously been no mention of this issue. And what it did, it introduced a piece of legislation or constitution that said that the fetus had equal rights to the mother and must always be considered equal. And we had the somewhat absurd situation in this particular legal case, where the fetus, at 22 weeks, had legal representation in court. What type of status is that? Uh, you know, the mother must always be first. She must self determine. Well, that's not what the decide. Constitution says, Doctor. I'm and that's why and, we need uh, to repeal the Eighth Amendment. And you'll see what, from the what hashtag. The eighth you'll eighth see the eighth. So, so guess what hold tight. Guess hold tight for family. a moment. Yes, guess hold tight for a moment. What? Because our community also want to join in the conversation. To so just all take a collective breath, and then Malika's going to share some more comments with you. Well, Dr. Favier, you mentioned the equal care for both, and so that's a question that our community is asking. Uh, Bishop Dorian, we got this from Sophie online. She says this law represents poor medical treatment of both mothers and babies, and our concern lies with both of them. So, what is the best way, in your opinion, to go about ensuring the care uh, and concern for both mother and baby? The, the yes, uh, as I was saying earlier on in the program, I think the mother uh, needed psychiatric care uh, and support. Uh, and I have to confess that one of we the big know that, concerns though. I have in, in our Irish situation is that asylum seekers don't get the same level of access to care in all sorts of areas as, as citizens do because of their status. Uh, that is a concern I have. But on the other end of the scale, the, the, the pregnancy normally lasts 38 to 40 weeks. And there's a very good reason for that in terms of the development of the child. And I, I, that's why I would have always uh, maintained in relation to this action that to terminate the pregnancy, even to bring the child into an incubator at 24 weeks, um, 
you know, is fundamentally unethical because it places the child at, at, at a serious disadvantage. What, what, what is required here is to provide the mother with care and to allow her with that care to bring the baby to full term. All right, guess, let me just ask you all of this because when I asked you if you thought this was a good act, everybody universally said no. What would you prefer instead? I'm gonna go round one by one. Be fairly brief, Shauna, what would you rather have? What, what we'd rather have is immediate repeal of the, the flawed legislation that was passed. We had um, a wonderful situation in Ireland. As I said, we were world ma leaders in maternal health care for the past 25 years consistently. What the Eighth Amendment of our Constitution does is it guarantees the right to life of the mother and child guarantees the right to life of the baby while ensuring that the mother receives all necessary medical treatments in pregnancy. And there's a big difference between receiving medical treatments in pregnancy and direct abortion. In the first scenario, uh, the mother is treated and um, her life is never put in jeopardy. Um, but the doctor also has a duty of care to the baby. Right. And uh, the baby will be treated and um, everything done to save the baby's life as and far as, 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 as possible. Now, in a situation... In a situation where uh, you have direct abortion, the only intention, the sole intention of abortion is that the, the, the child does not survive. If a baby survives an abortion, it means the abortion's gone wrong. All right, so Sean and is that's entitled what we don't to say what she would country. rather have. Uh, let me go to Dr. Mary Favia. What would you rather have instead of this act? Would you rather have? Well, as Doctors for Choice, we predicted this act was always doomed to failure and unfortunately it's come to pass much sooner and in the most awful circumstances that we could never have predicted. We need to move quickly to repeal the Eighth Amendment. That's take out that very flawed piece of constitution. And then we would argue we should follow the Canadian model and decriminalise abortion. Canada has no criminal code about abortion. We should regulate the provision of abortion services, include medical abortion, as was discussed earlier, which is, early, which is very safe, and place women at the heart of our care so that they can determine what their own reproductive needs are and give them a very basic human right that would have been, in this case, available in any other European country. Indeed, France has changed its laws very recently that up to 12 weeks, women don't need to give a reason as to why they want to terminate a pregnancy. Right. And so th that we need to prioritize women at the centre of yeah. this care. Dr. Mary, the average Dr. Mary Favia, we, we, Europe we, is we, one out of four babies are aborted. Okay. Um, I don't Dr. think that's What's interesting, that Dr. Mary Favia, we actually had an entire show around about uh, that eight-week abortion uh, rule in uh, France, and that was a very lively debate there as well. Bishop, if you uh, were able to set legislation, what would you do around this act? I think one of the mistakes that was made, and it happened arising to some extent out of the um, death last year, the tragic death of Savita Halapanavar, there, there was this suggestion that somehow or other uh, doctors needed absolute certainty in, in legal terms. And at the end of the day, the law cannot actually determine uh, what proper medical treatment is in any particular circumstance. So we said earlier it was very difficult to be talking about this particular case. Yes. In the end of the day, only a doctor treating the patient can determine what is the appropriate medical treatment. But the point is obviously from where I'd be coming from, there are two patients. Right. And when, when we talk about human rights, I think what I would like to see is that we understand that human rights derive from our nature as human beings, and there are two human beings here, and therefore there are two sets of human rights. And finally, Sarah. Yeah, well, Galway Pro-Choice and the National Abortion Rights Campaign would say that we need to repeal the Eighth Amendment immediately and introduce universally available, free, safe and legal abortion for all women in Ireland. I think what this debate is missing is the fact that our laws against abortion don't stop abortion in Ireland. They simply make it very difficult for certain types of women who don't have the means to travel to access abortion. We, we would say that all women in Ireland should have access to the health care that they require. Wow. As everybody suggested, that all as, as, as I, would, I would like to see something better for women personally in Ireland. I, I, I am actually going to wrap this conversation up. But as everybody suggested a, a better way, there was a conflict even with those other suggestions. So you can hear the debate right now here on this show. We're going to take it online. But I will say thank you to Dr. Murray Favia, Sarah McCarthy, Shauna Stafford, and also Bishop Kevin Duran. Thank you very much for being part of this conversation. We appreciate you sharing with us what's happening in Ireland right now. Let me head across to the online community who are saying what? Maria? Well, they're continuing the debate as well online. Counterculture writes, the unborn child has the right to life and must continue to be protected by the Irish constitution. On the other hand, Aveen writes, as an Irish woman, 
I can be anything, including president, that as soon as I become pregnant, I am nothing but a vessel under this law. Wow. All right. So thank you for being part of this conversation. On Monday, I am going to be watching the stream from Bali, Indonesia, with UNESCO at the Global Media Forum. Showing off much? <laughs> <laughs> but I will be watching, you'll be and you'll be us. doing what? So I will be hosting with yes. Dan Ming, our co-host, and we'll be talking about women in conflict resolution and their role. I love role. that show. I'm, I'm, I'm jealous about it. You should be. maybe I'll swap out. No, maybe not. We're going to ask <laughs> a very important question. We're going to ask why aren't more women getting a seat at the table? And we'll look at that impact on Monday. Until then, we'll see you online.